Oh, Bossa Nova, you know what that means? It means it's Friday. It means it's around 8.30 or just after 8.30 and it is time for Free Speech Fridays. Um, I love this part of the show. I love this way to kind of wrap up the week and talk to a couple of people I like who like to speak freely about the issues of the week and the issues that are kicking around. Joining us today out of Auckland for the first time this year, year is Nuwanti Samarakon. She is a former National Party candidate. She is a young entrepreneur and a go-getter who lives in the city of Sales. Nui, lovely to have you with us. Lovely to have you back. Thank you, Sean. Good to be back. All right, and from, Wellington, and from Wellington, the guy who was at ground zero had to shut the pub during the protests uh, a year ago, a year ago this week. Um, he is the host with the most, Alistair Boyce from the backbencher, Boise from the backbencher. Boise, how are you, mate? G'day, Sean. It's great to hear your tones. <laughs> <laughs> hey, mate, look, I, I been a fascinating week. You had a really interesting session yesterday. Um, looking back, because it's a year since the protest began, and man, were you ever in the middle of that. And to be honest, in some ways, we weren't um, broadcasting at that stage the platform, but it was the first issue we got into. Um, geez, a year on, and, and I, I, I said this to a number, I proposed this yesterday, a year on, I want, don't wonder if the people who comprised the River of Filth and took over your loading bay and... Um, and of course, all that chaos. Uh, maybe they won. Jacinda Ardern's gone. Trevor uh, Mallard is banished to, to Dublin. And a lot of the contentious policies that they were complaining about have gone up in a poof of ginger smoke, haven't they, Alistair? Yeah, I agree. They they did win. They, they would have had a greater win if they'd uh, left of their own accord with dignity and heads held high. I think that would have been a more powerful statement. Um, than allowing it to get out of control with the gangs coming in and the um, lot, the mass of violence um, that occurred on on the last day. Um, but overall, yes, they won. Um, they were vociferously anti Jacinda Ardern and her government. Um, and obviously Mallard destroyed himself. He imploded completely. And it would appear that the Ardoon government, from that point on, it was a um, it was a, a fall from the great heights, uh, and they did not recover from it. Yeah, no. For a Wellingtonian, the protest is something different, I suspect, from people in other parts of the country. But isn't it interesting to look back a year and say, "Boy, maybe actually that did achieve something." Yeah, I think it did. Yeah, sure. I'm uh, uh, asking Nui, Alistair. It oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I would agree with what Alice was just about to say, which I think is it, we've come a long way, and I think that level of, I guess, the movement, a grassroots movement of people that just genuinely had a voice and felt they needed to be heard, um, you know, got out there and did what they did. And, and yes, we, from an Auckland perspective, or at least for me, I remember talking to friends in Wellington and, and some who live in central Wellington who are like, you know, there's so much going on here, it's, uh, it's hard to kind of fathom, and and it was a lot to appreciate. Mm. Now, Nui, I just want to check, yeah. are you on speakerphone? I am. Is it not Can you know if you come off speakerphone because you're, you're cracking up? Can you do that? Sure. Okay, we'll give that a go yeah. and we'll just do a quick technical test. Is that, is be that better? That's way, I think that's better. It is absolutely Nui, sorry about that. And this that's is a right, this right. is a recommendation to all people taking part in calling in. Don't do bloody speakerphone unless you're in the car and it's the only safe way you can do it. All right, yeah. so so maybe they won. What a week, though. Do we buy now, uh, and an interesting chat with David Seymour first up this morning in the show, do we buy that Chris Hipkins after the, well, I, people call it a policy bonfire. I think he threw a whole lot of stuff in the dumpster and, and threw a match in afterwards. Do we now appreciate that this really is change or is this still window dressing, Boise? I'm, I'm still of the opinion that it's basically window dressing. I mean, if, uh, God forbid, uh, Labor get re-elected, uh, they've still got the whole state sector that is now in a sort of co-governance model and a ballooning um, model that sort of feeds on itself um, uh, and then if they, if they got another three years and they had enough power, I think the policies would be back on the agenda. 
there's no reason to believe they wouldn't be. So They're you're not buying. People. Say another word, Alistair. You're not buying it. No, I'm not buying it. Okay. Do you think it is a genuine change, Nui? Are you with Alistair no. on this? Oh no. I Why am not? Totally with Alistair. No, I'm totally with Alistair on this. I don't believe it's genuine change at all. I think they're just, it is absolutely window dressing. Um, I think what's becoming more and more clear is, you know, just everyone's starting to realise that, yes, you've got a new leader there, but it's the same team, Sean. It's the same team with the same agendas. And I don't think, um, you know, people are going to easily forget that he was the education minister for five years. And if you look at what's gone on in the education sector alone, I think it's pretty disgraceful. Yeah, and that's a point. So the syllabus changes, um, particularly in areas of history, um, are significant yeah. and con controversial. Yet, it's interesting, guys. Uh, the other issue I want to talk about today, this Human Rights Commission's report suggesting we have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in New Zealand and that we need to have major constitutional reform to stop the racism that is woven into the fabric of our society. Now, now, first up, just those things. Uh, I personally found, and it's not much that I can find personally offensive, Nui, I find painting that a, a publicly funded body paints such a dark picture of New Zealand and suggests things that would make, draw comparisons with South Africa in the times of apartheid. I find that kind of offensive as a New Zealander. Did you? I did. Absolutely, I did. And I don't understand what the end game is. That was what I was struggling to get my head around. Where are we going with this? And what, what are we going to look like in 12 months, let alone five years? And that scares me. Yeah. Uh, Boise, um, you with the HRC? Are you with Ming Foon or not? No, I, I um, struggled to listen through that interview. I tried again on the podcast this morning, but he was incoherent. Um, there was no rationality to it. I think what they're doing is fomenting racism in itself. I think uh, the co-governance, the way they're uh, allowing it and promoting it and everything else about it is um, is promoting racism as well. It's not doing uh, our race relations any good whatsoever. Mm. And doing a Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission for no obvious reason, the reason to do it is uh, because they've fomented um, this, this new form of racism by... Um, uh, promoting and all the way through mainstream media. Uh, if you watch TV One last Friday, there was half an hour of it. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, okay. Well, we even had a former race relations com uh, commissioner this morning, Greg Fortain, who actually grew up in apartheid South Africa, saying he thought the Human Rights Commission had used the long, wrong language and created a rod for its own back. But, guys, the other interesting thing was, uh, as we were kicking off that interview with... Um, with Ming Foon earlier this week, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Chippy, as I'm going to call him, because he's relaxed with a, uh, with a nickname, he came out and said, uh, questioned the Human Rights Commission reports and said there was going to be no Truth and Reconciliation Commission. How can you guys tell me that that's not genuine de of the Labor government? Nui? Yeah, I mean, exactly, Sean. I mean, it's, it's a little bit... Um I mean, if, 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 if Labor think that that's going to get them through the next six, seven months, I think they've really got to start thinking long and hard about how they're going to start communicating with the general public who are, I think, cottoning on quite quickly uh, what their agendas are. And those agendas aren't changing, you know. And, and it's, as, as Alice said before, you know, you, you get in, they get in, and within three years, there'll be the same things back on the agenda with the same people leading it. Mm. So... Yeah, yeah, but boys, I say, come on, at least he's talking the talk. Jacinda Ardern would have never have come out and said something like that. No, Jacinda Ardern was not going to U-turn. Uh, she, she was acquiescing all over the place um, to wokeism and co-governance. And, um, you know, I, I think I think history will, will see that she wasn't actually a strong leader and you, she didn't get strength through kindness. And she wasn't actually that kind uh, in, a, in, a, in a number of ways. Mm. But uh, Chippy's got um, public appeal, he's got street appeal, he's got a bit of street cred about him. Um, so he is a dangerous opponent. Uh, he can he can window dress and he will get uh, an effect. He's had an effect so far. It should wear off, but, but I fear that um, 
uh, so many of our uh, electorate has been bought off through um, you know the mainstream media telling the narrative uh, because I, I'll, I'll give you an example so I did a 30 minute interview with mainstream media yesterday on reflections after a year of the protest how much of that 30 minute interview do you think actually made it to air? Don't know, Boise. Zero. What? Because you were <laughs> telling the story that I made you famous. The platform made you famous during that. And, and I appreciate you, Sean. I've even signed up. <laughs> That's the least I'm, you can I'm bloody on Platinum Plus. Oh, look, while we're here, and Nui, just excuse us for a moment, Boise. I think we've decided we are going to proceed with the election night party. Oh, good. And we would like to do it at your place, so we must sit down and, and do a deal and figure out the logistics of that. Yeah, we'll definitely do that. I, I, I reckon right. it'll be great. You want great. to come, Nui? Yeah, so I was just going to say, do I get an invite? Yeah, I'll invite, all, I'll invite all the people that do Free Speech Fridays. It will be down in Wellington. And yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll okay. do an accommodation thing somewhere, and it should be a, a great time should be had by all. Yeah, boys, the inter interesting, isn't that? Because I, I looked at you as a person who... Uh, who didn't take a position on the protest but was in the middle of it a a and because you weren't extremist in your views on anything and sometimes it seemed to me, oh, what, what's he on about? Or is he still a bit confused by it too? Are you telling me, so what was the mainstream media organisation that didn't use anything of what you said? RNZ National. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they were appalled. You should have heard the silences at the other end of the phone and the, the trying to readdress the situations. I mean, uh, you know, you've got to provide a independent commentary and that, the mainstream media just still haven't got their head around so many aspects of the protest whatsoever. Um, they still think it's one entity. Well, it was about 10 different entities out there. They don't understand that the core and the infrastructure, and they hated this line, but the state trained the ex-army, ex-police, ex-firemen who conducted the core infrastructure. Remember all the generators, remember? Yeah, the, the oh, I system. can remember them tapping into a city sewer line to put in their own toilet. Yeah, and the water and all the power, the generators, and everything was totally organised. They cleared it on the last day, and the police allowed them to do it. In three hours, they cleared Molesworth Street um, completely. Now, the mainstream media still haven't got their head around the fact that on the, on the last day when the police came down uh, Molesworth Street and threw through the parliamentary grounds. On Molesworth Street, there were no cars. Yeah. There was nothing there. Yeah. <laughs> it was cleared. Yeah. So it could have been cleared with dialogue and communication and negotiation. So a lot of um, when uh, mainstream media was confused on the positions and stances I was taking, a lot of that was um, signalling um, in conjunction with the police and in conjunction with protest leaders to get dialogue and communication so that we could, um, you know, it, we could sort of get out of the whole mess um, and the, the points could still be made about mandates and freedoms and things like that. Yeah. And um, the police um, could clear it and we get Wellington back to yeah. a, a sense of normality. Yeah. Now, Wellington's never recovered. Oh, so come the on. CBD... No, it hasn't. The CBD, well, that's the, other reasons. The reasons that a CBD in Wellington isn't working is because it's full of beggars and people who should be in psychiatric institutions who are living in emergency housing that used to be student accommodation for international students. Yeah, that, that's one aspect. But um, the, um, the, the terror of the, uh, of the protest occupation for the state sector um, entrenched the work-from-home model. Yeah. All right, look, I just want to mention a Twitter poll I did on my personal Twitter account yesterday. Uh, it said, if you took part in the Parliament protest 12 months ago, how do you feel now? And the options were proud, ashamed, still confused. I got 2,152 votes, which is bigger than your average political poll, maybe self-selective. 79% of respondents said they still felt proud, 11% ashamed, 11% still uh, confused. Um, talking about mainstream media narratives, uh, Nui, you have got another weather event coming. Um, is this one going to be Wayne Brown's fault or do you think he's probably going to declare a state of emergency sometime this afternoon to stop uh, the Auckland be. media trying to, to hang, hang, draw and quarter him? I know. I think they've already declared it, actually, and extended it, or at least they've extended the one that we've been having. So, um, And I think his biggest message that came out yesterday was be prepared. So uh, good on him for front-footing it. I think the media just 
you know, didn't report on the real issues. Uh, in terms of that mainstream media, I think they missed a real opportunity to get the communities to actually work together and start to partner up and, and forge those relationships when people felt displaced and, and really vulnerable. Uh, and attacking the leader, the mayor, uh, you know, it was just rightly or wrongly, uh, it wasn't the time. And it was it was quite shameful, really. Yeah, absolutely. Now, are you prepared, Nui? Um, I am. I've actually I've always had a little um, a, a plastic box with the torch and the tin food and all those things and the dog food and all that stuff. Transistor so radio? That. Uh, yeah, a little transmitter radio, yep. Um, and then, but I think uh, I'll need to do some more shopping today <laughs> for the weekend, just in case. Oh, all right. You've got dog food and you've got the dog to take. Reese. Reese yeah. the dog to take care of. Ridiculous name for a dog is Reese, but, <laughs> but there you go. Particularly given Reese is one of the largest uh, Alsatians you will ever see uh, in your life. Um, all right, so, and, and look, I'll be honest, we've got some issues here at the platform. We've had some more to ingress problems in our Auckland studio. I've had our Auckland team down here this week. They're going to go back and check it on Sunday, but I'm still, fingers crossed, it holds if yeah. the cyclone comes. And I would say this one thing, Sod's Law is that the cyclone you think is coming that everyone warns about often is the one that doesn't turn up, <laughs> Nui. I know, that's kind of where we are. Well, that's where my head's at, but at the same time, um, you just don't know, do you? I mean, I, I caught up with a friend this week, Sean, just super quickly, and she lost five metres of land because um, she's got a beautiful cliff-top property in one day. Wow. Overnight. And the geotech guys that came the next day said to her, we expected you'd lose 10 in 100 years. Wow. So that's just the scale of, I guess, the situation. So I think my friends or people that, you know, genuinely have uh, sort of at the cliff edge, both literally and technically, I think are going to be thinking, we're just going to have to think of plan B or C, should yeah. they need to back it. Is it climate change, Boise? Or is it weather? Um, <laughs> I think there's, I remember I went for a holiday with all my mates, you know, as you do in the car and all that. And we were completely um, rained out, you know, flooded out of Remuera Motor Camp in the mid-80s. Uh, but this was way, way worse than that. Um, uh, uh, there's no doubt that humankind is doing damage to the environment, but I don't think it's uh, necessarily the, the primary factor for uh, climate change. I mean, there's all the natural factors. I mean, we've been through ice ages and all sorts, you know, so... Uh, there, there's got to be a balance about it, um, and let's deal with the practical realities and, and practical solutions without alienating, like the rural economy, for instance, with uh, ridiculous policies that contract it by 20%. Um, but there's no doubt that man is doing damage to the environment, and 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 ways is causing uh, climate change, but. Mm. It's by far we're not the only we're not the only determining factor. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, and someone's suggesting that these terrible quakes in Turkey and Syria were caused by climate. Oh, Julian Genter, I think it was. That's mad, isn't it, Nui? Oh yeah, for goodness' sake. I mean, <laughs> let's just focus on what the impact that's created for right. those people. Is, look, uh, look, the other that's story... That's infuriating. Like, I mean, it's just scaremongering. I mean, it's, it's really ridiculous. Scary. Yeah. Guys, i got to tell you, you will not be aware of the story. We're going to get into it next week. If you want real danger, here's the danger of climate change policies. A few years ago in Wellington, we replaced all our, or a lot of our street lamps with LED bulbs, right, because they were more energy efficient. Um, so these are on the big poles, you know, that like roads and stuff and main thoroughfares around Wellington. Well, though they knew it, they hadn't told us until the next uh, councillor raised this issue. Amongst those LED lamps and lamp heads that we put up on these super high poles over our roads, and this is just down the road from my house, there were a batch of them where the joints holding the lamps, which weigh 15 kilograms, were subject to corrosion or weren't corrosion proof pop properly. So there's been a whole is incidence of 15 kg lights off the top of power poles crashing to the ground randomly around Wellington. Oh my God. Gosh. <laughs> uh, 
And the council oh, says, God. we got a bad batch, but we don't know where we put them all. Don't worry, though. The light will get a bit droopy before it falls off and potentially crushes you. Imagine if the private sector did that. We'd be, uh, the, the council and the uh, compliance police would come down on us like a ton of bricks. Yeah. Seriously. So get on this. Get to, this is what the council person said. Uh, Richard McLean, I actually went to journalism school with Richard. He confirmed that a problem had been discovered in recent months that meant a very small bad batch of street lamps installed when the city changed to about 17,000 more efficient LED lamps in 2018 were suffering metal fatigue, at failing, then crashing to the ground. Well, a small batch out of 17,000 could be a couple of hundred potentially lethal street lamps around Wellington. Oh, God. So Unbelievable. You just have to like, what? <laughs> and of course, if it was a business, they would have to go and check everyone or they would have, they would be liable, right, for possibly killing anyone or any damage and you'd say it was negligent because they knew about it. So we're going to get... shutting us down. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. You should check, check around the back bencher. I'm sure you've got the same uh, lights. Um, it's a real worry. Look, the other story that just caught my attention this week in, in a... Really uh, turbulent week. The Chinese spy balloon story, which kind of penetrated my consciousness that the Yanks shoot down the supposed spy balloon and now the Chinese want it back. And now there are suggestions that there are thousands or hundreds of Chinese spy balloons, which I guess a lot cheaper than satellites, flying around the world. Uh, either of you, because I just looked and thought, I do not care. I don't particularly care about Chinese spy balloons. They own TikTok anyway, so who's trying to hold back the yellow tide? Are either of you at all concerned about Chinese uh, spy balloons? Or do you just think this is one of these mad stories that happens in the modern world? Nui? Uh, I'm not scared, no, and I don't really think too much about it. I mean, we think about drone technology today. You know, you could have your neighbours spying on you right now for you know. So, um, no, but you, it is, I think, you know, it's a cheaper option, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> and and <laughs> it's probably certainly out there, for sure, yeah. yes. Yep. Yeah. There's so many channels that we all use every day that are all Chinese backed. Yeah. Boise, you paranoid? You're yeah. worried about the chi average Chinese spy balloon coming over Wellington? No, no, I'm not. Um, I, I, I was watching a bit of the BBC as all this was unfolding, and, uh, and it was the main <laughs> the main news item. And then they don't do a summit, uh, you know, a diplomatic summit because of uh, a balloon, uh, and they <laughs> expend a rocket to uh, bring it down. <laughs> and the drama, you know, the drama. Uh, I'm sure they could have sort of uh, brought it down if they wanted to a much easier way and uh, then been able to actually look through the whole thing and see what it was all about if, if they were really worried. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, the, the, the drama of the whole thing was ridiculous and then it becomes an international um, scandal. I think during Donald Trump's uh, reign, uh, there were a couple of those went over the United States and he just didn't worry about it. Yeah. So. <laughs> all right, guys, look, I want to wrap up and thank you for the discussion. Lovely catching up with you both. And Nui, I know you've got to go and do the shopping and make sure Reese has got plenty of food for the uh, coming <laughs> biblical flood in Auckland, which will still. I guarantee you, Nui, if it's bad, yeah. it will. Simon Wilson and David Fisher will still find a way to make it Wayne Brown's fault. Yeah, gosh, I know. I think yeah. you, you, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but look, the one thing about this week, in fact, the last couple of weeks and, and the dumpster fire of, of getting rid of unpopular policies that, that Hipkins did on Wednesday, whether it is real or, or, or just cosmetic, Labor and Chris Hipkins are now the political story again. And all the headlines and all the focus is on them. And it would seem to me that Chris Luxon in particular uh, who was playing a sleepwalk to victory strategy, has been left somewhat floundering by the new administration, and he needs to get back in the game in a more positive way than he has been. Boise? Um, yeah, the, the National uh, needs to develop policy, um, which I, I, they will do eventually, but they don't want to lose too much more ground uh, with this 
uh, Hepkins honeymoon. Um, and you're right. I mean, the media have just got behind Hepkins and the change, and uh, they've deified uh, Jacinda Ardern, and now we've got the new deification of uh, Chris Hipkins, and he's the new saviour, yeah. <laughs> without any real analysis of what's actually yeah. going on behind the scenes or why they needed to ditch all these policies and why they were even um, promulgated in the first place. The, yeah. the, the amount of money that's gone down the down the tubes. It's, it, there's no wonder there's inflation in this country. Yeah. Every single policy this government touches to do with the state sector and the private sector and the way they run the country causes inflation. Yeah. And, and that goes all the way to immigration. I mean, if you don't have an, a, a, a pool, a workforce, a pool of labour, your prices are going to go up because your supply is going to go yeah, well, down. We've just Demand the minimum, stays the same. I imagine the minimum wage is going to hit your, you and your staff uh, totally, with, with totally. a knock-on. And the first thing... The yep. first thing my staff do is come in and go, oh, won't all of our wages go up now? That's yep. the full expectation. And then you have to sort of rationalise that back and say, well, we have to see if we can put our prices up. We have to see if the market will actually accept price increases yep. and where and how. Um, we've still got uh, liquor. All the liquor prices went up this month by between 5 and 8%. Yep. Have you got uh, a, chippy, the... a chippy thing on the menu? A Chris no, no. You better get onto I, that. I, I, well, no, I'm, no, I'm not. I'm, this happened when Phil Goff became leader, and I'm hope, hoping that the New Zealand electorate will see through this window. Oh, so it's not worth and he reprinting won't be around the menus. After the election. <laughs> but, uh, Nui, do you think he's re got the initiative? They are at least back in contention, Labor and, and National, but to get get going. Look, I think you, you, you said something really interesting, which is the whole Chris Hipkins has got the street appeal and he really is talking about the bread and butter issues that are facing New Zealand. And the one thing I find that people are still looking for is that street appeal with national or from national. So policies are, yes, very important. And, you know, I would absolutely say that. But I think everyone's also looking for the... So who is Chris Luxon? What is this going to, who is he going to, what does he stand for? What's he going to offer me? And I think these are some questions that, you know, you talk to a lot of New Zealanders and, and well, the people I keep in company with anyway, and they that those are the questions they keep asking. So, and that is something that, yes, we could argue that Labour is window dressing, but your, 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 your other side's got to have to front up and really now perform. Hey, guys, that is all we've got time for. In fact, we've run over time. Good chewing the fat on Free Speech Fridays. Alistair Boyce from the Backbencher Pub and Nawanthi Samanakone, who is going to get ready for the flood in Auckland. <laughs>